In those days, the Philistines gathered their forces to fight against Israel. Ashish said to David, you must understand that you and your men will accompany me in the army. David said, then you will see for yourself what your servant can do. Ashish replied, very well, I will make you my bodyguard for life. Now Samuel was dead and all Israel had mourned for him and buried him in his own town of Ramah. Saul had expelled the mediums and spirits from the land. The Philistines, the Philistines assembled and came <coughs> and set up camp at Shunem, while Saul gathered all Israel to set up camp at Gilboa. Gilboa sorry. Then, Saul, then Saul saw the Philistine army. He was afraid. Terror filled his heart. He inquired of the Lord, but the Lord did not answer him by <coughs> dreams or Urim or prophets. Saul then said to his attendants, find me a woman who is a medium so that I may go and inquire of her. There is one in Endor, they said. So Saul disguised himself, putting on other clothes, and that night he and two men went to the woman. Consult a spirit for me, he said, and bring up for me the one I name. But the woman said to him, surely you know what Saul has done before, has done. He has cut off my media, the mediums and spiritists from the land. Why have you set a trap for my life to bring about my death? Saul swore to her by the Lord, as surely as the Lord lives, you will not be punished for this. Then the woman asked, whom shall I bring up for you? Bring up Samuel, he said. When a woman saw Samuel, she cried out at the top of her voice and said to Saul, why have you deceived me? You are Saul. The king said to her, don't be afraid. What do you see? The woman said, I see a ghostly figure coming up out of the earth. What does he look like? He asked. An old man wearing a robe is coming up, she said. Then Saul knew it was Samuel, and he bowed down and prostrated himself with his face to the ground. Samuel said to Saul, why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? I'm in great distress, Saul said. The Philistines are fighting against me and God has departed from me. He no longer answers me, either by prophets or by dreams. So I have called on you to tell me what to do. Samuel said, why do you consult me now that the Lord has departed from you and become your enemy? The Lord has done what he predicted through me. The Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hands and given it to one of your neighbors, to David. Because you did not obey the Lord or carry out his fierce wrath against the Amalekites, the Lord has done this to you today. The Lord will deliver both Israel and you into the hands of the Philistines, and tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. The Lord will also give the army of Israel into the hands of the Philistines. Immediately Saul fell full length on the ground, filled with fear because of Samuel's words. His strength was gone, for he had eaten nothing all day and all that night. When the woman came to Saul and saw that he was greatly shaken, she said, Look, your servant has obeyed you. I took my life into my hands and did what you told me to do. Now please listen to your servant and let me give you some food so that you may eat and have strength to go on your way. He refused and said, I will not eat. But his men joined the woman in urging him and he listened to them. He got up from the ground and sat on the couch. The woman had a fattened calf at the house, which she slaughtered at once. She took some flour, kneaded it, and baked it without yeast. Then she set it before Saul and his men, and they ate. That same night, they got up and left. Thanks very much, Alison. Hi, everyone. Uh, why don't we pray together uh, before we uh, get into this passage? Father God, we thank you uh, so much for your word. We thank you uh, for uh, how precious it is. We thank you, Lord, uh, for your presence, which is here with us now. And we pray that as we look at this passage, you would challenge our hearts, you would encourage us, and that we would do uh, um, this for uh, your glory in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let me start by asking you a question this afternoon. Where is your heart today? Now, some people in the audience will probably be thinking, well, it's here in my chest. That is not the question I'm asking you. Let me move back a bit. 
The question is, where is your heart today? Where is your spirit today? Where is your mind today? You might be in a place where it's peaceful. You might be in a place where you have contentment. Or maybe you're in a place where you have turmoil and maybe you have pain in your heart. And I wonder if I ask you the question, where does God feature in your heart today? Deuteronomy chapter six, verse five says this, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. This is a commandment from the Old Testament. Notice it says we are to love God with all our hearts, all our souls and all our strength. So if there is one God who stands supremely powerful and valuable, then surely this demands a supreme and total loyalty from you and me, a loyalty that starts with the heart. That means other people and even ourselves aren't the thing that is meant to be at the center of our lives, the center of our hearts. That thing is supposed to be God. So what happens when something takes the place of God in our hearts? What happened to King Saul when he followed his heart, a heart that had turned away from God? What happens to us when we do that as well? What happens to us when our hearts grow hard towards God? Well, these are deep questions. I want you to think about these in your uh, mind as we explore our passage together today. Where is your heart? Last week, we looked at 1 Samuel 27, and we got a glimpse into David's life living on a knife edge. Driven by his desperation to escape the mad King Saul, David crossed a red line, didn't he? He joined the Philistine army. He pledged his allegiance to the Philistine king and was ready to fight for them, Israel's greatest enemy. And just when we were about to find out what the next step was, we're whisked away and taken to a breaking news story in chapter 28, which Alison just read for us. King Saul is facing his deepest and darkest challenge yet. Have a look at verse four. The Philistines are once again lining up their armies to attack Israel. Last time this happened in chapter 17, King Saul was terrified. So terrified, in fact, he couldn't lead his army into battle. But all was not lost. God sent him a rescuer, a young shepherd boy called David, who defeated the Philistine army by killing the giant snake man Goliath. On that day, David became Israel's champion. And on that day, he was confirmed as their future king. Now, this was a great victory for David, but also for his people, the nation of Israel, defeating their greatest enemies. However, time and time again, King Saul doesn't share in this victory. We see time and time again that Saul was corrupt. He was chosen to be Israel's first anointed king, but his trust was always in his own strength, in his own ability. And he didn't love the Lord with all his heart, soul, mind and strength, did he? He loved himself. He loved his own heart and he loved his own strength. How do we know this? Because we've witnessed his increasingly erratic behavior and attitude throughout the book of 1 Samuel. Now let's compare these two characters. Let's compare David first of all. David proved to be a great fighter. Age 17, beating Goliath, he went on to rise up in Saul's army, first as a servant to the king, then a general, and then as Saul's son-in-law, winning one battle after another, and always winning it for his king and his people. Interesting motivations. But David's success was also his downfall in the eyes of Saul. Every success that David had was like a red rag to a bull in King Saul's eyes. Saul became increasingly depressed and paranoid by David's successes. Saul allowed his rage to lead to furious hatred, burning towards David. Many times when David was in his presence, Saul struck out and tried to kill him. And David endured constant threats from Saul's temper and his spears, we all remember his spears, assassination attempts, traps, forced exiles, close encounters after being hunted across his own land. And yet, as we read about his deadly encounters, the author shows us something distinctly different in David's heart, in his attitude and his responses towards God. David is always conscious of his God. 
He nearly always seeks to honour, listen and follow God's commands. I say nearly because he wasn't perfect, as we know from reading through the book. But many times, in fact, David had the chance to kill Saul and held back. David loved the Lord with all his heart, soul, mind and strength. And the Psalms are full of David pouring out his heart to God. In fact, Sam read from Psalm 103 uh, this afternoon. David wasn't perfect. He knew killing God's anointed king was wrong. And he was to keep trusting the Lord and leave revenge and justice to the Lord. And what about King Saul? I've already said a little bit about him. But on the opposite side was Saul. Nasty temper, total lack of trust in God, leading him to make one terrible decision after another, spiralling out of control. And despite God's repeated warnings, that's very important, despite God's repeated warnings, Saul had continued to ignore him, pushing God out of the picture and outwardly dis disobeying God. Where was his heart? Well, we can say it's far from God. Saul didn't even listen to God's prophet Samuel. Saul's continual lack of wisdom, his continued stubbornness, eventually led to God's spirit departing from him. And in our chapter, Saul is on his own now. But this is exactly where he always wanted to be, isn't it? He always wanted to push God out of the picture, and now he's on his own. And so we have this picture. Samuel the prophet is now dead. David is in exile, and a huge army is lining up to destroy King Saul and his people, the nation of Israel. But Saul is not uh, brave and courageous. In fact, he's terrified desperate for a word of reassurance from the Lord. Look at verse six. He inquired of the Lord, but the Lord did not answer him by dreams or Urim or prophets. It's important to realize that this is a crisis of Saul's own making. The Urim was used for guidance and kept in the ephod, the breastplate of the high priest. But in his rage, a few chapters ago, we read that Saul had killed all the priests. Only one had escaped and taken the ephod to David. So God doesn't answer by prophets anymore because Saul has rejected God's own prophet, Samuel. And so what is Saul feeling now? All alone and terrified. What drives his next action? Look at verse seven. Saul then said to his attendants, find me a woman who is a medium so I may go and inquire of her. I remember at the beginning of the chapter, it clearly says that all spiritualists and mediums had been banished from the land under Saul's reign. That's verse three. This is exactly what God had commanded for his people. The punishment for contacting a spiritualist or a medium was death, just as the Lord had commanded. So surely, surely Saul would not do the unthinkable. Surely he would not contact a medium, seek out a witch in Endor. Surely not. Well, as we know, if you read the passage, he did. He was desperate, alone, afraid, and God was silent. I just want to pause for a second and think. Maybe you too have encountered a moment like this in your life. Where you have been to a place where you never ever imagined you would go. You considered compromising on something that before seemed so wrong. I would never do that, you tell yourself. But in a situation where God seems silent, it can often feel right. Can you see what is going on here? Can you see the consequences for Saul in turning away his heart from God to himself? Over time, he's found himself in a complete place of silence from God and in a place where he's got nowhere to turn. He's isolated, just following his heart, which is full of himself and his own wisdom. And what's, he, what's driving him? Fear. Saul knows that what he's doing is forbidden by God, and so does the witch he encounters in the passage. But Saul is insistent. He's willing to do anything. He pushes God out of his mind. And you may have circumstances in your life where you can feel that you have pushed God out of your life. The witch is scared, but Saul doesn't share in her fear of punishment. Saul has crossed a red line and is sinking to his lowest depths. He takes the Lord's name in vain and swears by God that the woman won't be harmed. Saul doesn't seek the Lord. 
He's no longer remorseful. He's no longer repentant. At no point in this passage does he indicate that he wants to back out. This was an awful mistake, that he wants to flee. In fact, he commands the witch, bring up the prophet Samuel from the dead. As the witch performs her magic, she sees a ghostly figure rising up from the dead and is terrified. The ghostly figure that rises appears to be the prophet Samuel wearing his robe, but could this really be Samuel? I'm just gonna just take a few moments to explore the idea of mediums and spiritualists. When I was doing research for this uh, passage, I read that there were 11,000 spiritualists registered in the UK. And as you'll probably know, there are lots of spiritualist churches around. There are lots of people in the UK and the world who claim to be able to contact and raise people from the dead. So I wonder what you think of this. Maybe you think it's all fake and these people are just looking to exploit the vulnerable and the poor. Maybe you think it's real and they are really able to contact the dead and the outer world spirits. Maybe even people in this room have had experience of doing this. Maybe you've been to a spiritual, spiritualist church. Maybe a family member of yours has been to a spiritualist church and told you about it. Maybe someone in your family has tried out a Ouija board. Or maybe, just maybe, you have a deep desire yourself to contact someone who's died, a loved one from your family or your friend. Maybe you've considered that. Maybe you've wondered, is this the right thing to do? Well, the Bible gives lots of examples of the existence of a spiritual world. And God gave this command to his people in Deuteronomy 18, verses 9 to 13. When you enter the land the Lord your God is giving you, do not learn to imitate the detestable ways of the nations there. Let no one be found among you who sacrifices their son or daughter in the fire, who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft, or casts spells, or who is a medium or spiritualist, or who consults the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord. Because of these detestable practices, the Lord your God will drive out those nations before you. You must be blameless before the Lord your God. Now to the Lord, contacting the dead or spirits is detestable, but it doesn't say in that passage that those things don't exist. These things do exist, things that are visible to us and invisible to us. There is a spiritual world created and ruled over by God. So while some medium spiritualists, Ouija boards and senses are fake, some are very real. And the Bible warns us that they are very dangerous. God makes it clear in his word, the dead do not contact us. They do not haunt the earth. The encounter that many spiritualists offer with a loved one is not a loved one who has died, but the encounter is with an evil spirit and no good can come from it as we're about to see in our passage. God says that we should not be seeking after any other spirits other than the Holy Spirit. Remember the command, we're to love the Lord, our God, with all our hearts, souls, minds and strength, not to seek after any other power. So back to Samuel appearing from the dead. The ghostly figure that appears is wearing a robe. Could this be the same robe that Saul tore back in 1 Samuel 15 when his kingdom was taken away from him? Or was it God working to make it appear this way? Well, whatever the means that God is using, Saul drops to the floor, uh, bowing his whole body to the ground out of fear, out of reverence for this ghostly figure. You can feel the desperation he has, his anxiety and fear. The passage says that he hasn't eaten all day. So you know what you're like if you haven't eaten all day, you're dizzy, you feel weak. And in verse 19, King Saul pleads his case. Saul wants answers, just one word of comfort, a guiding hand, some sort of mercy, reassurance for the outcome of this battle, just to be told everything will be okay. But the chilling moment in this passage is not so much Samuel rising from the dead or this ghostly figure as what he says to Paul. Look down at verse 16 and we see some of the saddest words in the whole of the Bible. Samuel says, the Lord has departed from you 
and become your enemy. Aren't they the kind of worst words you never want to hear? Samuel can give no comfort or reassurance to Saul. Once again, like many times before, he pronounces the Lord's judgment on Saul. And there is nothing, absolutely nothing, that Saul can do. There's nothing left for him to do. His consistent and persistent sins, his consistent defiance and rejection has led him to this moment in history. Facing the Philistine army is one thing that has always made him fearful, but that is nothing, absolutely nothing, compared to having God as your enemy. Consider these words from Hebrews 10, 26 that say, if we deliberately keep on sinning after we've received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. I remember the first time I read that verse, I was terrified. I'm still terrified by reading that verse. But let's be clear about something. It is Saul's own actions that have trapped him, trapped his sons, and trapped his nation, his own actions. Earlier in the week, I was debating with Tim whether we should feel sorry for Saul. Saul was chosen as um, Israel's first king, even though he had serious character flaws. So should we feel sorry for him? But actually, as we read through the Bible, this passage and the other passages in 1 Samuel, we see time and time again that he's given opportunities to repent and turn back to God, and he refuses to do it. Verse 19, God pronounces through Samuel that they are all, Saul and his men and his nation, to be delivered into the hands of the Philistine army, and this time they're going to be annihilated. The Apostle Paul writes uh, something similar as a warning in Romans. He says this, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. Scary words. God makes it clear that if people continue to go their own way, if people continue to reject him and follow their own hearts, if people continue to ignore Jesus, who was sent as our rescuer, then God will eventually give them exactly what they want. He will give them over to their sin. He will give them over to their life without him, and there will be no turning back. Saul's fate was sealed. He failed to love the Lord with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength, and he received God's wrath and judgment. This is scary stuff. And we never want to be in this situation, do we? We never want to be in a situation where we think to ourselves, if only... If only we had obeyed God and listened to his word. If only we had turned back to God while we still had the chance, while we're still given the opportunities. We do not want to be in this situation. And we don't want to see our friends and family in this situation ever. So back to our passage, we read that it was the witch who actually has compassion on Saul at the end. And she is the one who makes him a meal and encourages him to eat it Surely it should be the other way around. Saul should be doing that for her. And the last sentence in our passage says that Saul and his men ate, got up, and left in the darkness of the night. Does this remind you to any passage in the New Testament where someone ate, got up in the darkness, and went out? So is this where the story ends for us too? If only we'd listened, obeyed, followed Jesus in this life, and what if you're thinking right now that you relate more to Saul than David? Maybe you relate more to the heart of Saul, a heart that is turning away, or maybe you have turned away from God. 
a heart that has something else in place of God and a heart that is not willing to wait to hear from his word. But making decisions, rash decisions by ourselves and giving into the things that are driving us right now. That's not the end of the passage. That's not the end of the sermon, because the wonderful truth is the wonderful, amazing, <laughs> precious truth is that God's heart for us is so much bigger than our hearts can ever be for him. Jesus is the light in our darkness. He loves us. He loves you so deeply that whilst you and I can so easily turn away from God, Jesus was dying on a cross so that we could know the freedom, faithfulness, forgiveness, and love that he has for us. And so we never have to face the judgment that Saul was given. Isn't that amazing? The Bible tells us that those of us who know God will be able to share stories of how God has fulfilled and satisfied our hearts in a way that no one and nothing ever could. I wonder if you can think of friends and family who have told you they will never believe in Jesus. They're not interested. They've got their life set out before them. They won't come to church. They won't read the Bible. They're not interested. I wonder if you can think of people like that. I can think of people like that straight away. And I can also think about people who have had that view in their minds and then had a radical transformation in their lives and have come to Jesus. God heals our hearts. God takes away our fears, our pain, our suffering, and he fills the gaps in our souls that no one else can. We have a God who is patient. We have a God who is kind, who is the very definition of love. He is merciful and he is forgiving. And he is a God who is also full of holiness and full of justice. Perfect love and perfect justice mean that we can't leave our sin, he can't leave our sins and rebellion unpunished. But the Lord brings us to a place of repentance and forgives every mistake we have ever made through his son, Jesus. And for those of us who relate to Saul's heart this afternoon, right now we have a choice. To turn back to God, let him into our hearts, to ask and to receive his forgiveness. He calls us to respond to him every day, to love him every day and to follow him every day. And I want to emphasize the point. There is nothing, absolutely nothing you or I have done that God cannot forgive and heal us from. Absolutely nothing. So let's learn from Saul. Let's be honest about where our hearts are today. Let's let God in in a way we haven't before. Let's commit to love him with all our heart, mind, soul and strength and praise him with all our heart uh, and praise him with all our heart because of how much he loves us in his son, Jesus. Now, you might be thinking, OK, great, got that. I need to love God with all my heart, soul, mind and strength. Uh, but what does that actually look like? What does that mean? Well, it means that the love we're called to must be wholehearted life encompassing, community impacting, with an exclusive commitment to our God. And this God is our God only because he has now revealed himself to us in the person of his son, Jesus. The kind of love we should have for him doesn't exist apart from the love of Jesus. For Jesus and the Father are one, it says in John 10, 30. This truth means that every part of our lives needs to be open to Jesus. We need to invite him in to cleanse our hearts. In every relationship, our lives must be influenced by Jesus. This call to love God in this way destroys any option of being just one person in a church or in our little safe groups. What you do on the internet needs to be just as pure as what you do in your Bible reading. The way we talk to our friends and our family needs to be as wholesome as the way we talk to our brothers and sisters in Christ. There needs to be an authentic love for God that starts with god oriented affections, desires and thoughts that impact the way we speak and the way we behave, that influences the way we spend our money and our forms of entertainment. So whether we're eating or singing, jogging or blogging, texting or drawing, the love for God is to be in action, not just words and seen by the world. If you want this, can I invite you to pray with me now?
Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for your word, which is eternal and true. We thank you for this passage, Lord, that is full of warnings, but also full of encouragement. We pray, Lord, today, as we go away from here, as we uh, step out of this room to continue worshipping outside, Lord, that you would fill our hearts and our minds with love for Jesus. Please help us to remember what Jesus has done for us. And I pray, Lord, that you would give us the courage and the strength uh, to love you with all our heart, mind, soul and strength. In Jesus' name. Amen.